welcome to you all and thank you very much for joining us for this um, Friday seminar of the Middle East Centre at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. Uh, our subject today is War on Bodies, uh, Moral Immunity and the Psychopolitics of the COVID-19 Pandemic in Iran. And I'm going to introduce our speakers, or our main speaker and our uh, respondent in just a moment. Kide, who is our main speaker, will speak for about 20 minutes, perhaps a little bit more. Uh, Mar Marziar will then respond for about 10 minutes and then I, I will give Orkide a chance to uh, come back on, on any of the points that Marziar raises. And then we should still have about 15, 20 minutes for questions from the audience uh, before finishing the session promptly uh, at six. Uh, so uh, it's now my great pleasure uh, to, to welcome to this Friday Middle East Centre Seminar, Orkide Behruzan. Orchide is a physician, a medical anthropologist, and an anthropologist of science and technology, and I would also call her a historian, although she hasn't put that in her bio. Uh, she's the author of Prozac Diaries, Psychiatry and Generational Memory in Iran, which was published in 2016. She currently works at SOAS uh, in London and previously held positions at King's College, also in London, and at the University of Texas. Uh, her PhD was in history and the anthropology of science and technology from MIT. Uh, and uh, she's also the founder of the Beyond Trauma Initiative, uh, which I recommend you all to uh, look up and visit. Uh, and she's a bilingual author and poet in both Persian and English. So Orkide is our speaker this evening, and our respondent is Mazia Ghiabi, who's welcome lecturer in medical humanities at the University of Exeter. Uh, he's worked uh, extensively on illegal drugs and addiction in West Asia and the Global South, and that was also the subject of his first book, Drugs, Politics, Managing Disorder in the Islamic Republic of Iran, which was published in 2019. His current project is called uh, Living Addiction in States of Disruption. Uh, Marzia has worked previously at SOAS and Oxford, and also at the École des Hautes Etudes and at Sciences Po in Paris. Uh, and Marzia obtained his DPhil in politics from uh, Oxford University. So I think that's enough uh, by way of brief introduction. I'm now going to ask uh, Orkide, please, to speak to us. Thank you, Orkide. Uh, hello, and um, good evening to everyone. It's at the end of a long uh, working Friday. So uh, I really appreciate people joining us, especially in the UK. And I thank you for, for this invitation. It's such an honor to, it's lovely to be back in Oxford always, even, even if virtually. And it's all, also um, a great pleasure to be in conversation with Mazi again um, and uh, discuss this topic. Um, today, as we emerge from global lockdowns, it's really easy to forget the life of the then epidemic of the coronavirus um, in Iran in early 2020, when Iran Iran became the main epicenter of the outbreak outside of China, and this was before um, the pandemic was announced on March 11. So I refer to this as an epidemic by uh, up until March 11, because this has clinical implications um, in, in the timeline I present. And I wanted today, I want to just in the interest of time, I just want to want to want to give you a very brief overview of um, an ongoing uh, project. Um, that I'm working on and I am really here for feedback. So uh, please be patient with, um, with the unfinished uh, nature of, um, of the analysis. Um, Iran's pandemic response has been discussed widely by scholars, uh, including uh, uh, Maziar. Um, and what I want to add here is, is um, a, a different angle, a sort of a small additional angle about what the pandemic reveals uh, in terms of the psychopolitical life of an illness and hence a society and also immunity. Uh, and I, you know, the, the key argument is that in Iran, the pandemic arrived um, in individual and social bodies that were already immune compromised. And the reason why I'm working on this framework of um, immunodeficiency and immunity and the immune system in terms of the political and social body in relation to the political body is that um, uh, I'll explain why this analytical framework um, is is helpful in understanding uh, Iranian society in this particular at this particular juncture. 
Um, I've uh, followed the outbreak, um, both as a medical and social uh, construction for over a year now. And um, I, I, the premise here is that an epidemic or a pandemic is a biological and a political entity. And its emergence, its manifestation and its governance are intertwined with uh, complex cultural and historical um, contexts and, and also political agendas, um, as well as biological um, realities. And so, um, on top of this, I'm very much interested in the psychological um, life of the pandemic, not just in terms of the toll it's taken globally on people, but also in terms of how it's shaped psychologically and psychopolitically. Um, so here I want to put a magnifying glass on the period between January 2020 and March 2020. And there is a reason why I'm doing this. So the, the format of this book that I'm working on is it, it starts in a, in a diary form. Um, so I kind of provide a timeline with detail, um, detailed updates um, from the grounds, from the hospitals in Tehran and in uh, major cities. And, but I, I, there's no time for me to go over all of that um, right now here. So let's go back to February, 2020. Um, the most significant uh, defining feature of the coronavirus pandemic in Iran or the epidemic then um, has been the politicization of the outbreak and also the securit securitization of information about it. And it's been a trend all along, even now in relation to vaccines this week, uh, we just we encountered another uh, instance of um, securitization of information and a ban uh, about inf publishing information about the import and export of vaccines. Sorry, import of vaccines. Um, so the first wave of the uh, emergence of the infection in the holy city of Qom uh, in early February was kept secret for weeks, and there was a systematic cover up that um, most of you know about. Um, and these weeks were crucial as a golden uh, window, as we say in epidemiology, for preventing the spread of the virus and limiting fatalities. And later in February, when the outbreak was no longer a secret, still none of the standard public health measures to contain the outbreak, including social distancing and all of these things that have now become normal and routine, uh, were prohibited. And, and there are reasons for that. And this resulted in the spread of the illness outside of Qom and the creation of several new epicenters, first in Gilan and Ozandan, et cetera, et cetera, and then uh, also into the region. And, and in the, um, one of the assumptions that people make is a lot of this cover-up, um, uh, historically, these kinds of cover-ups have been associated with, with ideologies. Um, we have Mazi here in the virtual room. Uh, who knows that the cover-up in relation to HIV AIDS, for example, in the 1980s and 90s was, was to some extent ideologically driven. And here, the, um, the reasons for the cover-up um, are uh, very conspicuously political and economic. Uh, and the political and ec economic agendas or interests that were in con conflict with um, public health policy in February, and I'm emphasizing this very particular window uh, of time um, uh, had to do with, uh, to some extent, with the strategic significance of the city of Qom um, as as uh, a seat of uh, the seat of the Shia religious establishment and political and financial and uh, and uh, um, the political and economic power players. And also, there was a lot of. I, I don't want to go into the details because we don't have time. But there is something about this, the uh, the traffic in and out of Qom uh, because of the pilgrims the, the city of Qom receives um, uh, uh, both domestically and from foreign uh, pilgrims. Some 2.5 million um, uh, each year, and also uh, the connections with China in terms of um, uh, clerical students, as well as workers, as well as the infrastructural projects that China has in, in GOM, including the solar plan. So all of these things have been discussed, and I can go into them in the Q&A uh, if anyone is interested. So GOM was not an unlikely epicenter uh, in, a, in a sense. <clears throat> and the other factor um, that was very important uh, was that an election was coming up on February um, 21st in 2020. And so a major um, uh, impediment in, in the way of, uh, you know, the circulation of information was that there was a very direct decree from the Supreme Leader that, you know, information about this disease should not be circulated until next week, until the election. So 
so most of this was extremely sensitive information at the time. At, at this point, a year more, over a year later, uh, it's public information. Everyone knows about um, these, these timelines in Iran. And public health experts and clinical experts, um, including members of the parliament and medical, the medical establishment, uh, were urging the government to intervene with um, uh, quarantine measures, et cetera, et cetera, not unlike what happened here and in other countries later. Um, they were encouraging the government to uh, stop flights from and to China, uh, close the shrines. And at this point, shrines in Karbala and Najaf were already closed, <clears throat> but not in, uh, Iran. And uh, also the mobilization of reliable data via media was, uh, was uh, sort of suppressed. Um, Iran has a 24-7 um, health uh, TV channel, uh, health-focused uh, TV channel called Shabakis Salomat. And until late March, there wasn't a single word on this channel about COVID. Um, so that's, that in itself is telling. Now, um, so this clash, internal clash was ongoing. So experts and factions of the government were encouraging one thing, um, actions were different. And, um, and so similar things happened to calls for closing schools, universities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And at this point, most of my reliable data was coming from the ICUs within hospitals in Iran. My um, former classmates, my colleagues, my friends um, were on the front line, so to speak. So to speak. And uh, also in social media, medical uh, professionals were, um, were uh, basically the main medium uh, through which this information could travel. On March 3, on March 3rd, sorry, the epidemic was dubbed um, at diff by March 3rd. Uh, the epidemic was dubbed at different points as a conspiracy theory by the establishment, um, as a foreign, uh, as an American conspiracy theory, as a transient issue. And there were backlash, uh, there was backlash created in hospitals um, because high fatality rates were already, uh, again, public knowledge in uh, places like Gilan. Um, that which was the second uh, epicenter outside of Gom in early March. The next days brought really sad news um, about uh, doctors and nurses and health workers dying. Um, and a lot of my colleagues were very adamant to emphasize that this, these deaths were preventable and they were not inevitable. Actually, this is quite personal for me because I have I've had classmates um, in, in uh, among them. And I know personally doctors, and at this point, many of uh, the medical professionals know uh, someone personally who has unfortunately passed. And the point they were trying to make was that this was not because of a shortage of PPE. Uh, it, this was because we didn't know this disease existed in February. So people were intubating patients without a mask. And so this is something that's now palpable. It's, it's an open wound um, and I think it needs to be discussed. Uh, I'll get back to this. Then in March, schools and universities shut down sort of and basically ramped up efforts um, uh, started. So there was a delay, but the efforts when they started, they were very impressive. So um, there was now a COVID task, task force in the country, COVID wards, uh, media campaigns, uh, educational campaigns via television um, and the internet. Healthcare workers um, were now um, called the defenders of, um, of health and martyrs of health um, and, and, and not to the legacy of the um, Iran-Iraq war um, in terms of the, def and also the defendants of the shrine in Syria. So that all of this vocabulary and a new discourse of defense and, and martyrdom emerged. Mass mobilization of the military, um, uh, the Revolutionary Guard, and NGOs, etc. And a lot of this again has been outlined by, by others and, and very aptly analyzed uh, by uh, people, including Mazi. So I, I'll just um, uh, move on from this. Uh, by mid March, um, all of these measures were in place, um, and then there was um, uh, there was the promotion of the stay at home messages and self isolation campaigns, and it, and and something akin to uh, test and trace uh, started. And then, of course, on April eight, many people had to go back to work. Um, there was a phased lifting of a, of the lockdown, and um, 
you know, it's, again, similar to other places, the, the question was what, whether we should save the economy or, um, or you know, people. And, and um, bear in mind that this is, a, this is a time where Iranian economy is extremely um, stuttered. Um, and in the back of the U.S. sanctions, and um, uh, and so at this point, even when there were um, you know measures in place, data was still securitized, and um, also information. There was two things. There was one, uh, the securitization of information. People were still being arrested for tweeting or to, for or, or for spreading information about uh, COVID. Um, and also asymmetric access to testing kits. So just like now when how we are relating to vaccines, if you remember back in you know a year ago, it was all about testing kits and PPE. And you had government officials and their families being tested, and then frontline workers and ICUs were running out of tests. And, and we're seeing, seeing a similar pattern now with vaccines, unfortunately, with the black market and corruption and lack of transparency. We are um, now hearing really concerning reports about vaccines, which I'll get to later. Um, so one of the, it, you know, by, by mid-March, of course, uh, COVID has reached Canada, Europe, um, the United States, um, uh, and on March 11, we have a, a pandemic on our hand. And lockdowns across Europe begin, as does a, the frenzy of the pandemic response in the US. And so a lot of this global condition is now creating a very um, helpful comparative perspective. These in, the impressive plans that are implemented in, in Iran for screening calls, contact tracing, um, uh, you know, also people's compliance were applauded. Iranians were, very, you know, at the beginning, they very much um, adhered to the rules. And then, of course, there were issues of travel during holidays, very similar things to what we saw during Christmas here, for example, was happening around Nowruz last year. Um, and the medical community's heroic efforts um, were also hard not to recognize. Um, the a lot of issues were starting to to, to create um, controversies on social media. For example, at this point, um, you know there were there were a lot of uncoordinated efforts. The Revolutionary Guard was televising maneuvers, disinfecting streets um, and trees and cars with with uh, portable cannons, uh, parading on motorbikes and shouting slogans that you know we will defeat Corona all the way to Iran's decision to reject the Médecins Sans Frontières um, uh, aid, um, and in fact, actually sending back uh, um, the help that the MSF team uh, that was supposed to create a, a temporary ward in Isfahan. So there was a lot of un, unaccounted for decisions that had, of course, um, implications for citizens and high death tolls. The first major peak happened in uh, April, um, and uh, this was followed by a second wave in June, a third in September. At this point, my medical colleagues were saying, you know, the word peak doesn't mean anything or waves. It's a plateau. It's, it's, it's just coming, you know, when it's repeating so many times, they're not waves anymore. Um, and then in October, November, there was a high fatality uh, episode. In 2021, the Supreme Leader banned the import of vaccines provided by COVAX on the, on the, um, on the basis of them being from the United States and um, you know, European countries being manufactured, manufactured there. And promises were made about the manufacturing of vaccine, the, the Iranian vaccine. Right now, 15 trials are um, underway uh, in Iran on the Iranian vaccine, on, on creating a vaccine, manufacturing a vaccine. Um, at this point, as we speak, Iran is slowly emerging from a fourth peak, um, while the politicization of now vaccination has resulted in high rates of um, uh, death. Um, vaccination is now underway, primarily with Sputnik and Sinopharm with the Chinese and Russian, uh, and recently AstraZeneca, Oxford AstraZeneca, uh, provided by COVAX. But um, efforts are lagging behind meat um, and uh, are not unlike many other countries in the region. Uh, and of course, at this point, the, the spirit of solidarity has worn off. Um, and so the psychology of this April and last April are extremely different, similar to how we're experiencing it 
um, here in other countries. So in uh, the conversations, and, and I'll, I'll stop in April now uh, to, to go back to the actual question. In a lot of my conversations with medical colleagues in hospitals in Iran, um, I kept finding us discussing this question, uh, which was this, why is Iran showing different demographies of death? Uh, we know that COVID was uh, targeting vulnerable groups, older populations. In Iran, the number of young people in ICUs was already drawing attention. Um, and, you know, the, the, the medic in me immediately thinks, you know, if you're stressed, your immune system is compromised. We know that stress makes you weaker. Um, and so, of course, I have to hold back and not think medically. But in, in those moments, these are the conversations that were happening between us and also in my own mind, which is why I, I have chosen the format of this, like journaling and, and time, you know, creating a um, chronological timeline uh, for the first half of the project. Um, I think the, a lot of the speculations coming from, you know, and this is about ethnographic data, this is not about what we like to think, a lot of speculations from, uh, from people on the ground was um, summed up in sentences like this, what has the year 1398, which is 2019 basically in Iran, um, been but stress? This is, and another colleague told me, this is allostatic loads of stress, you know, uh, imposed on the body. What do you expect? And I also heard myself um, in, uh, you know, found myself in a lot of conversations of, with, again, people on the ground um, dealing with patients who were saying, it's very hard to separate deaths caused by COVID from deaths caused by infrastructural and, and, and political issues. It, if you die of COVID, it doesn't mean you've, you've, you've been killed by the virus. That was the bottom line of their uh, actual you know, situated knowledge and experience. And what does that mean? A lot of references to the 1980s at this point started to surface. Um, the terms, you know, the, the, the Iran Iraq war, the terms um, trauma, grief, uh, and also military metaphors started to emerge. Um, in, in public discourse, in the media. Um, and, you know, here in the UK in spring 2020, there was a lot of uh, uh, parallels made with the metaphors of the World War, Second World War um, and, and the spirit of solidarity. And it was mobilized after the lockdown that started in March 23. But the war metaphor in Iran is different. It's manifold, it's layered, and it's actually replying to wounds that are still open and are still being um, in, uh, for the lack of a better um, metaphor, they're still um, bleeding. And this public anxiety of, around illness was something that I'm, I've always been very interested in and the dysphoria, which is not only the outcome of the epidemic, but also um, uh, an underlying sense of what psychologists call learned helplessness and an internalized perception of powerlessness, uncertainty, uh, mistrust, uh, anxiety, and a sense that ordinary people's lives do, don't matter, basically. These, are, these perceptions matter, whether we agree with them or not, they matter because they shape the, the lived experience of an illness and of, a, of, a, of an epidemic and of a pandemic. And the collective nervous system uh, was overstretched at this point because you know this year the third in the Iranian calendar 1398 has been dubbed the you know annus horribilis in horribilis of Iran. Um, it started with natural natural disasters. The Iranians call it a dark year, um, and it was a year that carried a lot of tragedies and losses akin to war torn the war torn decade of the 1980 uh, 80s. Um, Floods and earthquakes aside, there were renewed uh, American sanctions. Um, it, the economy was in downfall. Then an estimated 300 to 1500 people were killed um, and some 7,000 people were arrested during the protests of the month of November in that same year, during which time the government shut down uh, the internet for, for a whole week. Uh, and so Iran was a, in a blackout, the cry on, on social media, the cry, can you hear us, became the Iranian equivalent of I can't breathe in the BLM movement. Uh, and in January, after the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, Iranians spent a long week dreading the specter of a war uh, 
with the US that almost happened. Um, and then that was shortly before they found that they had been lied to uh, about the shooting. Um, uh, and now it's become apparently clear that it, this was an intentional shooting of the Ukrainian airline passenger flight um, by the Revolutionary Guard that killed 170 six innocent people. And so mourning and processes of um, uh, um, processing these perpetual losses um, has been a luxury that Iranians haven't had. So the, the general perception is one thing on top of another. We haven't had time to you know, catch our breath, that kind, of, that kind of feeling. So you have to imagine that mentality and also understand that public trust being at its lowest, we were looking at two parallel crises at this point in relation to the pandemic. One was a crisis of credibility and legitimacy because people don't trust data that's coming from the establishment. Um, uh, in, in, and in general, the, this divide is, has, has always existed, but now it's sharpened. And also a crisis of expertise, which I, I, um, I talk about it in my previous book, actually, um, as a long-term legacy of the Cultural Revolution. At this point, we are dealing with a generation of policymakers who uh, are the basically what the Cultural Revolution um, uh, aimed for uh, policymakers that are not necessarily experts, but they're committed. And even and at this point, of course, um, there you know the commitment also is also under question given the neoliberal directions that the establishment has gone towards. And so at this point, I you know this is the um, the question. The actual question is. Why, uh, why, what this context tells us and why it's different. And this con specific context um, is not just a post-war or post-rupture context. It's a wartime peacetime symbiosis of ongoing cohabitations with, this, with sensations of death and war and disintegration. So I work on this notion of um, a, a social and collective um, uh, immunity. And I refer to notions in medical anthropology, um, uh, notions such as local biologies and also uh, Emily Martin's flexible bodies, the idea that immunity is a not something that's um, uh, in the individual body, but it's actually dependent on what's happening to the social body and to the political body. And the intersection of these two bodies um, is where uh, uh, the specific psychopolitical processes and forces with which a pandemic gains a local life uh, come to surface. Um, the two features so in this what i'm calling it the, 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 the immune the immunitary biopolitics of this space um and this is again uh, in reference to notions that we have in medical anthropology is shaped by two key themes one is the normalization of um, death and decay and this could be death or perception of death or metaphorical death and also war. And in terms of war, I, I finished by this um, focus on war because uh, for a social and political body that is ostracized, excluded, or stripped of its resources, for a social body that is in a state of helplessness, um, a similar response, uh, responses that are needed to keep a body immune are not available. And so COVID has both exasperated and uncovered social inequalities. We know that happen everywhere. But if biological immunity is interdependent on the lived experience of the social body and the political body, that has implications for social immunity. And it's not a coincidence that um, those hit hardest by COVID in Iran are the poor, the marginalized, and the politically oppressed, and the social groups whose protests were also heavily um, uh, cracked down. And so it's in the juxtaposition of these these um, in the individual life of the illness and the social life of illness. Um, I mean, one of the things that might, you might find interesting is that the word immunity in Farsi um, and the word security in Farsi have the same roots. I mean, in fact, in Arabic, imeni uh, and amniat. And these two discourses have become so intertwined that a lot of deaths are, um, uh, are justified in the context of securitization and security. Let me finish by saying that, um, you know, I can go into, you know, it, in, the, in the second section, we can talk a little bit about this notion of living death, gradual death, everyday death that people talk about, especially in, uh, in the realm of everyday, and what that means for the social body and the political body. This social immunity is a prerequisite for biological immunity. 
So if that infrastructure is not in place, the actual body is not also not um, um, functioning. So in terms of the metaphor of the war also, there is, um, you know, we are all familiar with the metaphor of the war in relation to the immune system, but in this, uh, uh, in this space, we are also looking at COVID itself as war. We are looking at the legacy of the war because this is a respiratory illness that's targeting actually veterans, uh, chemical veterans of Iran uh, as some, part of the vulnerable groups. There's the presence of the war, a war um, as an economic war in the everyday life of um, citizens. There is the threat of war and securitization of life uh, um, you know, this idea of there's always a war uh, impending and the lived experience of the war and the discourse of war. So the, the language and imag imaginaries of, of the pandemic are um, very much, you know, there's a lot of images and, and pictures and uh, snapshots I can show you um, and how these metaphors are mobilized. And then, of course, there is war on health. Um, I'm just going to finish in two minutes, one minute. War on health, um, on education and on training, which uh, has implications here. Um, yeah, so let's let's go to Mozi, and then I'll you know if if there is time, I'll say something about the this immune immunitary biopolitics. That's great, Orchidea. Would be, I, I would love to listen to you more, but I'm very conscious that we have to finish sure, right yeah. now and we want to get on to the Q and A. So uh, without more ado, I'm going to ask uh, Mozi now, please. To respond. Thank you, Edward, and thank you, Orkide. It's great pleasure to be back at the Middle East Center virtually for the first time, and very good to talk to, to Orkide. It's our second conversation on COVID, uh, a few, like, probably a year after our first conversation, so there's a lot to discuss and how our ideas probably have changed. I'll start from uh, actually a very interesting etymological connection that uh, you revealed uh, to us, the connection between imeni and uh, amniat, so immunity and security. And I would suggest that there is another one that connects to these two, which is uh, uh, to believe, amen, no? And belief is a key point in, uh, in, in, in uh, discussing and thinking about and also relating to uh, the epidemic, to health in general, actually, because of course health is uh, an epidemiological manifestation, uh, in this case of a virus, but is, it is also framed into an epistemological crisis. And this epistemological crisis in Iran is probably more evident than elsewhere, but it is evident all across the world from, you know, those uh, who deny the virus in the US or Italy or elsewhere, the, or those who uh, argue that only following science would save us, even though we don't come to define what is science at this point. So this, I'll try to discuss a bit uh, very briefly, of course, because I don't have much time, this epistemological crisis that uh, in which Iranians and, and the Iranian state, of course, found itself and, um, over the last uh, more or less 14, 16 months now. Uh, this epistemological crisis, uh, if, from what I have gathered, and my, my work has been mostly, if, if Orkide has worked with physicians and people at the very front line in hospitals, my collaboration has been mostly with social workers, people who work mostly outside the hospital setting, either in prevention or in post-treatment uh, 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 facilities. And, um, and with marginal populations. Uh, not all the categories that Orkide mentioned, but many of the marginal categories uh, that have been heavily affected by, by the epidemic. Well, the epistemological crisis that COVID has created in Iran is one that I identify as connected very much to fear. Uh, and it's a fear that it manifests itself in, on several levels. Uh, let's start from the state. Uh, the state, Cover up uh, that you very uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, clearly mentioned in detail, and was one uh, which I believe was very much framed in fear. It's a fear that, of course, confuses uh, the sort of the mind, and you think that actually the virus actually didn't exist, or you deny it because of the fear of uh, either being accused of, uh, in, in the context of March last year, of uh, 
wanting to stop the election, electoral process. So if you put ourselves in a hypothetical situation in which the Iranian state stopped the elections and sort of put everyone in lockdown measures, there, there, there would have been a sort of an outburst in the short term of accusations of saying, oh, you want to stop the electoral process because of uh, your fear of people's reaction, or this is another authoritarian reaction. And so, of course, in the long term, the Iranian state would have come out as a successful model. And this actually, this fear in governance uh, highlights one of the shortcomings in governance of the Iranian state over the last many decades now, I would say, which is uh, the short-termism in, in the responses to the crisis. That was the case as Otide mentioned uh, in the 90s with HIV. It took a long time before acknowledging it. Once they acknowledged it, the response was more effective than many other countries. Um, we will see whether COVID will produce long-term responses that are more effective than other countries. Uh, from what I notice on working with social workers in, in Iran, so the collaborating at distance given the situations, is that there is a sort of important framework of solidarity and mutual aid that is emerging and has emerged in part uh, over the last 15 months, which sees margins of the state, so official, official state institutions engaging in sort of grassroots participation with people and also private citizens and groups that have been able to uh, provide uh, services and, uh, and help that would have been otherwise very difficult. And this is not simply a manifestation that kind of substitutes the states in a neoliberal fashion. In my view, it's probably the antidote to the social and uh, sort of fear that this organization creates. And this connects to it, what, another effect of fear, which is the rise of uh, right-wing politics in general. If you look at the globe, for instance, you know, countries where right-wing, uh, parties have been in power have had the highest number of cases and the sort of most serious impact in the pandemic. Trump, Bolsonaro, Modi, and I would say, unfortunately, even, uh, well, our own Boris Johnson. Um, well, because fear and the lack of knowledge, the, the epistemological crisis pr produces reactions that are often uh, uh, very concerned with short-term management, but lack the sort of uh, um, commitment to organizing society in a different way. And struggles around health are struggles around future political settings. Also, another issue that uh, I don't think I have much time, Edmund. Uh, so I'll well, I covered two very minor impacts of fear, but I leave it to the to the. To the audience. No, it, was, it was great, Mazia. Thank you very much. But, but um, you know, the eloquence of our speakers is eating into our time, and uh, we have we have uh, audience members who are here, and we have some questions already. So um, I, I'm just going to ask Orkide, Justin, if she wants to pick up on anything you said very briefly in just two or three minutes, uh, please do so, and then I'm going to open the floor to the to, to the questions that I've, I'm collecting them. And please do keep putting your questions in the Q and A box. I'm sure we'll have time for a few more than are there now. Thank you. Orchide. Thank you, Mozi. This was, um, you know, it, this is exactly what I want, a conversation. And, you know, because this this idea is still in the making and is shape, being shaped. The short termism that you talked about is um, precisely related to that crisis of legitimacy and the anxieties that comes with it and, and the crisis of expertise. So it's a combination of those two uh, crisis, which I mean, that we have ex excellent doctors. I'm not talking about lack of expertise. I'm talking about policy and expertise. And the state of exception here is also important because it's in the intersection of uh, an interaction of existing states of ex exceptions that have just sort of toppled up on top of each other, that a new form of what I'm trying to think about immunity is fabricated, um, not just political, but also moral and psychological, because Every, you know, the fear angle is very telling. This is about a, a, a psychological and moral construction as well. And it unveils forms of lethal um, immunodeficiency, if you will, that predates uh, COVID and are shaped by at the intersection of various crises. I just want to say one thing in relation to how I, I see this 
uh, sort of immunitary landscape and biopolitics working in the sense that um, it in, in a way it um, it masks many COVID deaths because we have also this instance of like, we, there's no trust in which deaths were actually caused by COVID. But at the same time, it biologizes and naturalizes a lot of deaths that are in fact deaths of despair or people what have called them deaths of decay and disintegration. At the same time, it's, it, it depoliticizes these deaths. But in some ways also repoliticizes um, this form of moral immunity efficiency that the structural body of the society, the, the social body is suffering from. And I think this is a, the, the establishment can use this sort of strategically as it suits them. Um, and the other thing it does is that it also reveals these um, immunopolitical fantasies of the state. So Mazi, this idea that there is also something about fantasies I'm working on in terms of, um, you know, how, you know, security versus immunity, amniat versus imeni, and aspirations and, and fantasies. And of course, these discourses are mobilized as they fit. And I think when we look at the question like this, um, questions like you know monocausal questions become very redundant and 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 we also deal with a lot of monocausal questions in relation to COVID in Iran and I um, I think the question of how uh, these forces intersect and interact to compromise both biological and psychological and moral immunity is something that requires an engagement with what you were talking about and an engagement with historical context and political context. Thank you, thank you very much. So I'm, I'm going to forego the usual chair's privilege of asking the first question in, in the interests of time, um, but I'm going to go, uh, our first question is from Mehdi Askarier, and he asks, can you elaborate on the air carrier Mahan's flights to China and its significance and impact on the spread of the virus? But I, I'd like to broaden the question a little bit uh, and ask you, perhaps to reflect a little bit on how in Iran, China is viewed in relation to COVID. We've seen in, in many parts of the world that, that, that the pandemic has led to uh, instances of, of racism or of very negative perceptions of, of China or, or of East Asian individuals and communities. Uh, but this of course is at a time when the Iranian government strategically has been uh, wanting to uh, align more with China. So there's, so there's something of a, of a tensional paradox there. And I, I wonder whether you could uh, speak to those points. Uh, of course, I mean, in relation to specifically to Mahana uh, airline, it's important. Uh, I think the question is raised because of this reference to the fact that uh, in uh, end of January, the, the Iranian government uh, the government actually confirmed that flights um, by Mahana Air Airline uh, will stop, will discontinue. And then it emerged a month and a half later that the 55 flights had actually operated throughout February and, and March. And so there was again, another instance of deceit and, and cover up. And uh, with, with China, I mean, perceptions on the ground about China, of course, vary. Um, one of the important things is to understand that China has become a lifeline in part because of the American sanctions. And, and so in a way it's, you know, a, a very important strategic ally uh, uh, economically, but also geopolitically. And so in, in, in terms of the, the, the perceptions about China, and if I want to speak very anthropologically here, in terms of the, the, the way these relations are imagined by the public, a lot of, um, you know, the, the awareness of the, for example, this, this um, rumor or, um, or statement that was going around about the 700 clerical Chinese, uh, Ch Chinese clerical students in Gom who were traveling at the time of the Chinese New Year to Gom that was responsible or a businessman who was flying from Isfahan to, um, to China back and forth what this was responsible so there is a lot of anecdotal evidence that goes around also the missionary uh, activities are very important again like there is there was a lot of traffic between China and Gom uh, in February because it coincided with the Chinese New Year as well. Thank you. Maziar, I think you wanted to uh, add yes, something. Yes, just very quickly. And I think here, you know, what, what Orkide just mentioned is very interesting because it, it brings our, uh, so the question of the epidemic on a geopolitical level that not only works, of course, uh, between states, but actually in the perception of everyday life among people. 
uh, like a couple of vignettes from, from uh, you know, talking to people is uh, that many are refusing immunization through now the, what is perceived the British, uh, the British vaccine. So AstraZeneca is being uh, you know, uh, refused by many. And instead they seek, of course, the Russian Sputnik V and now increasingly the Chinese vaccine, uh, Sinopharm particularly. Uh, the same goes with uh, pills being distributed in little villages, and I've heard of this, which are capable of curing the symptoms of COVID among people. And people trust them because now it's Chinese, you know, contrary to what we would think the made in China label would mean generally. So things are also changing uh, in, in, with regard to that. Very quickly, I mean, I, I could. Thank you both. Uh, our, our second question is in fact two questions uh, and it's coming from Kavya Moussavi and he asks first a, a, a methodological question. He says, did you do this research while physically in Iran? And I guess actually both of you might uh, respond to that, um, but I, I, I'll, I'll read the second part of the question. Uh, he says, if so, what was the impact of the publication of the health minister's letter confirming dispatch of the five vaccines to the Supreme Leader's household a week after the, uh, the, the uh, Security Council, I guess, had officially banned the US and the UK vaccines in Iran. So that really is, I think, speaking directly to these questions about mismanagement, inequality, uh, and you know, perception uh, uh, of the way that uh, privilege gets you uh, access to scarce resources in, in, in a situation like the one Iran has found itself in. Uh, Orkide, please. Yeah, so the, no, I wasn't physically in Iran. I, you know, uh, travel is actually not possible. Right? It hasn't been possible this year for me. But uh, I think this is why I emphasize on this crisis of legitimacy and crisis of expertise, because this pandemic response has been part deceit, part dysfunction, part you know incompetence, part U.S. sanctions, whatever. That that's not the the point. Is a lot of these patterns are being repeated. Everything we're seeing now with the vaccines, we saw with test kits and PPE a year ago. Uh, that you know officials had access to tests uh, when ICUs didn't. At the with the vaccine, um, yes, the Supreme Leader banned the import the import of. Um, uh, uh, COVAX vaccines, and that had implications that actually people on the ground, again, I, I keep referring to people on the ground because it doesn't matter what we think sitting here, it, what matters is perception on the ground, is that these are death slash murders. These deaths were preventable, these deaths were. And so a lot of health workers, again, in this fourth peak died. And so that's, you know, people see that as a direct um, result of the uh, lack of access. The vaccine management, then again, you know, for vaccines to work, you don't need just a vaccine. You also need a chain of uh, distribution that needs months of prior work. So when countries were fighting to secure contracts with Pfizer, Iran was uh, dealing with this ban, right? And so right now you, you have anecdotes of, yes, of course, um, officials have all been vaccinated before you know, ordinary people. Yes, uh, vaccines are being sold at whatever price, um, but we don't have that infrastructure for the freezers. And the, you know, so there are all these questions and all these like black holes where that, and this lack of information, this lack of transparency directly affects um, a vaccine compliance. So people have hesitations because this is the Russian vaccine and the Russian and Chinese vaccine haven't been approved by the um, FDA. So that's another um, angle here. The resistance to AstraZeneca uh, is also in uh, Mazi because of the global issues with clotting and that, that became a very um, highly debated in Iran and people were really, really scared, scared you're right. Um, so I don't know if I answered the question about the Supreme Leader, I, that, I wouldn't comment on that, I wouldn't be able to. Mazia, do you want to come in on that one or shall we go to the next question? Uh, I, well, I just to respond, I didn't do research in Iran, of course. <laughs> no one, I think, can do research uh, legally, at least at the moment. Um, but I relied on a network of collaborators, long-term collaborators, which are social workers and have been at the front line. And, and so, yes, and also, you know, distant interviewing, so talking to on the phone. Thank you. 
Uh, so uh, Nahid Siamdoust has a question. So she, she writes, uh, thank you for your insights. On social media, we have seen people comment on how the social sphere has become more permissive as a result of the life death urgencies of the pandemic that led other matters to pale in comparison. I wonder whether the speakers believe that there will be some permanent political, social, structural changes in governance that will flow from the conditions of the pandemic. Hello, Nahid John. Uh, it's, it's good to uh, hear from you. Um, of course, there will be implications in governance. I mean, governance, uh, as, as Mazi pointed out, the anxieties within uh, the realm of governance have already been transformed throughout this past year. And I think the social response and public perception of that has also changed. So I, definitely there will be implications long-term in terms of how these perceptions have changed. Um, I'm not sure if I follow the question in terms of the social space having become more permissive. Permissive in relation to what? Um, you mean so, like social liberties or like? I'm, I'm, afraid, I'm, not sure. I'm afraid this is the this is the downside of having the questions done in a Q and A box because we can't ask Nahid to. But we to have to also that. remember that we are we are also um, uh, waiting for another uh, election. Uh, you know, in uh, in June, and. The question of vaccines, I mean, not unlike here and not unlike in Israel and, you know, in, in February, that was the case in Israel, in the UK, that was the case for the elections in May. The question of vaccines and the election are also very intertwined. There is, this is a very particular election, a presidential election, because the public trust is at its lowest. Um, there is a very active campaigns of uh, boycotting elections going on in a way that weren't before from inside Iran and from the families of the people who were killed in these protests. And so there are now grassroots campaigns. So in that, th those kinds of challenges to governance are, are in a way, I, I wouldn't say they're the result of the pandemic. I think the pandemic is also uncovering a lot of what was already brewing. And Masiar, do you want to add to that? No, not really, because it's hard. I mean, I can say that, well, maybe I can add something that in the social sphere, I mean, it's hard to think of a more permissive social sphere under a limited lockdown regime. It means that a lot of people couldn't actually go out much. So much of life has been quite restrained to home, especially for middle class, upper class people. Whereas lower class people, uh, I'm more sort of ethnographically in touch with rural communities, completely different setting, people go on with their lives but yeah. close in the environment of the village and the surrounding villages. So the sort of urban rural connection is a bit restrained. That's the comment I can say. As, as for like, you know, sort of Southern Tehran and things like that, I haven't really been able to, 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 to know much. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time. We've got certainly time for one more question. We might manage to squeeze in two. So I have a question from you. Uh, uh, apologies if I don't pronounce the name correctly. Yasser Piracha. Uh, and uh, the question is, if there is time, can Dr. Behruzan perhaps elaborate a bit more on everyday death and decay in the Iranian context? Uh, so a little tiny question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, well, I will promise to discuss this with Yasser. It was a wonderful, uh, one of our wonderful graduate students at SOAS. Um, uh, given that we have three minutes, do you really want me to go into this? Because it's, it's, it's a really big question. And it's, you know, but I'm glad it's brought up because in a way it's the running theme in this book project, which is the, the, the shaping of this, um, this collective immune system has been uh, dependent on the, the knowledge, a tacit knowledge of things disintegrating. I mean, examples, uh, ethnographic examples of deaths that are, you're in the hospital, you've recovered from COVID. And these are tragic stories that I'm constantly receiving. You recover from COVID, you're a 27 year old woman. Um, and then you um, die because the hospital's oxygen supply suddenly collapses. So this awareness among people that a lot, is this a COVID death? Is this a, a, a death of, you know, decay and disintegration in the infrastructure, in the, you know, you know uh, the way public health policies have been working in the, and also juxtapose that with the 
wonderful work that health workers then are doing with empty hands. And so, so I think that it's a very big question. I, you know, I think we will, we will have to discuss this um, at another point. We have literally two minutes left. Okay, I'm, get, I'm going to take the last question, so I didn't take the first. There's another one. And I, I know that both of you have been in touch with many professionals, I mean, health uh, professionals and, and, and social worker professionals. Uh, I'd be very interested to know whether you think that there is any significant difference in the sort of experience and perception uh, of the pandemic, of the, the groups that you've been in, in touch with compared to the wider public. Do you, do you see some big divide there depending on profession and expertise or perhaps first you mean with health group, health professional yeah. um well the, the the situation with health professionals as elsewhere is of course different from the general public partly because of the viral load that they're yeah. exposed to they've been exposed to and that we know that that you know biologically speaking they are at a higher risk but what's what's significant now is that the the fatigue and the the emotional fatigue again not unlike other places but there's an additional layer in Iran uh, which is for example Iran has a shortage of nursing staff and more and more nurses are now quitting because they're just you know they just can't and a lot of private hospitals are even are losing nurses so what that means in terms of the you know I just let me just refer to this. I just did a project on um, the impact of sanctions on medical education. And a lot of these medical doctors who are in training tell you that, you know, even if I go around things like access to the latest whatever software, um, psychologically and morally, I'm, I'm demoralized. I mean, so that I, I think in that sense, if you put the experience of 14 months of a pandemic, 15 months of a pandemic, plus demoralization, plus thinking that your life has, people have referred to health workers' lives as um, human shield because they were basically expended in the early, that period of time I talked about, they were, ex, uh, they were used and expended and uh, no one is accountable for it now. So these, these wounds are open. And at the same time, there is this public appreciation for the work of health workers that has increased and, and that, that has then healed another one that was open before, which was distrust between public and, and health workers. So it's a bit complicated. It's a, there's a lot of back and forth yeah, there. Very helpful. And I'm afraid there we're going to have to leave it. You're going to have to write to Marziar for his answer to that question. I, I will bother him uh, myself uh, outside the context of this meeting. So it remains for me just to thank again very much uh, Orkide and Marziar. We're, we're all applauding loudly, though you cannot hear us. Uh, and I'd also like to thank our audience for, for joining us on this Friday afternoon. Uh, thank you all very much for being here. Thank you so much, Edmund, for having us. Thank you, Edmund. Thank you, Rikide. Pleasure. Thank you, Mazidam.